This video is brought to you by Morning Brew. Hi, welcome to today's episode of Cold Fusion. This will be the final episode of the year. The world always assumes that Google services will be there. From Gmail and YouTube to online storage, search and smart homes, we take it for granted. Each hour, YouTube has 30,000 hours of video uploaded, Google has almost 230 million searches and an enormous amount of emails are sent. In terms of connections, Google controls about a third of the surface internet. But on Monday, the 14th of December 2020, all of Google's services suddenly disappeared. Across the world, users were unable to access emails, kicked out of ongoing Google Meet sessions. One Twitter user even said that he was left sitting in the dark with his toddler as his Google Home system had failed. The crash had become one of the biggest social media trends. It sent waves of panic across businesses in many parts of the world. How could one of the largest companies suddenly go dark on all of its services at once? What happened? Was this a hack? In total, the outage only lasted one hour, but had already caused a lot of chaos. When it was all over, most people forgot about it and went about their day. But this event stuck with me. When you analyze the situation, some interesting things emerge. Not only are consumers dependent on Google, but many businesses that you may not think are also. Is the world too dependent on Google? And how does Google avoid downtime in the first place? In this episode, let's take a look. You are watching Cold Fusion TV. The Google outage caused pandemonium across the world. Some of the biggest companies in uh, the country use Google, and this includes Uber, Airbnb, Pinterest, Netflix, Spotify, Twitter, Instacart, the list goes on. Employees not able to uh, re reach not just uh, these services in terms of Gmail, but in some cases get into the system at all. Uh, lots of companies use Gmail to quote unquote authenticate as you've tried to get into di different websites and web services, Salesforce, Dropbox, so many others that use Google simply to get online. Uh, in certain cases, uh, that's inaccessible too. It's also hitting quote unquote the real world nest heaters, as you know, that uh, control heat, air conditioning and the like. Those appear to be down as well across the globe. There are companies literally in standstill as we speak. We'll Get see it. wake up call. Not like we're dependent on this, right? <laughs> I mean, th this cannot <laughs> exactly. No, no, this cannot happen. This is this is it. This is it. Gmail, Google Search, YouTube, Google Docs, Google Drive, Nest Home Systems, Google Play, even Stadia, all gone. The Wall Street Journal newsroom was dependent on Google services, so during the outage, some reporters had to resort to using telephones to collaborate in writing stories. Some schools in the US had to close for the day. Wayne Westland Community Schools in Michigan gave its combined 10,000 students the day off after Google crashed. The school relied on Google Meet for classes. Many other educational institutions would have been affected due to the prevalence of online classes because of the ongoing pandemic. There were also cases of the management of medical companies not being able to check on the schedules of physicians and other medical staff, nor being able to contact customers. Remote work and learning have left individuals and businesses more dependent on online services than ever, and in this domain, Google is the most widely used. All in all, the outage affected billions of people worldwide. So what happened? A Google spokeswoman told the Wall Street Journal that there was a problem with the company's system that authenticates login credentials. She stated that the problem was due to internal servers and that the issues weren't the result of a cyber attack. This explanation doesn't give us much, but that's just about all that Google wants to say about the issue. As you'll see later in the episode, just maybe there was something more to this outage than first meets the eye. It really is rare for Google to have such a global outage like this because even a single physical geography is served by multiple servers across the world. And even on these servers, there's multiple backups that rapidly come online if there's a problem. So as we've seen, so much commerce and people's livelihoods rely on Google. It raises some serious questions. What if next time Google was down not just for an hour, but for days? Billions of dollars in revenue could be lost by companies around the world. So how does Google prevent this? How does Google basically never go down? 
Google calls their plan to keep their services up and running Site Reliability Engineering, or SRE. Coined all the way back in 2006, SRE is a digital design philosophy. Basically for Google, the idea is to get software coders to run software management instead of getting IT managers to run it. People call this kind of philosophy DevOps. Basically, development software coding that provides the outcomes of a system administrator. The thinking goes as follows. Software coders will get bored by performing tasks by hand and naturally build tools to help automate the process without the involvement of actual people. In fact, Google has written a book about this, which I'll link below. Google states that SRE is its most fundamental feature. Todd Underwood of Google in 2016 told Wired magazine, quote, we long for the day when nobody runs anything. It's interesting because traditionally, development and operations were opposing forces. The devs always wanted to build new software and get the changes out to the public as fast as possible. But the operations staff wanted to ensure that nothing went wrong. And the best way to do this is to keep the changes to a minimum. The trick that Google found is that if you combine development and operations, you can get a powerful synergy for a reliable system. It makes sense. Google is the world's largest online empire. So the more humans you have running things, the more probability there is for mistakes. So just have code run everything. But within that, human coders can still make mistakes. Though another question must be asked, is the Google empire too big? Some say that Google's outage, temporarily crippling the productivity of billions around the world, has just made the biggest antitrust argument anyone could have ever done. Currently, Google is facing off against the US Department of Justice for violating antitrust laws. So according to the US government, the answer to the question of Google being too big is yes. It's the biggest antitrust case against a tech company in at least a generation here. Nothing is off the table in here, which could include a breakup uh, of Google. The following information is from today's sponsor, Morning Brew. Google's lawsuit is one of the biggest antitrust cases since Microsoft in 1998. While monopolies aren't technically illegal, shutting out the competition is. The Department of Justice argues that Google illegally ensures that its search engine is the default option preloaded into cell phones, from Apple's iPhone to its own Android phone, and this blocks out competitors. This lawsuit will take more than a year to go to trial, and it's one of many antitrust lawsuits against the company. You can read stories like this, or anything on business, finance, or technology, at Morning Brew. Morning Brew makes the latest news fun and easy. You can get up to date with all the latest breaking news in just five minutes, all in one place, without having to trundle through different news sources. It's delivered to your email inbox each weekday and Saturday. Click the link below to subscribe to Morning Brew today. It takes just 15 seconds to sign up, and it's free. So where were we? All of Google's services going down all across the world for about an hour. The result was pandemonium across businesses and individuals alike. And then we learned how Google keeps things running with site reliability engineering. So moving on, what about hacking? So to combat the threat of hacking, Google often runs hacking championships. These feature hackers who report security problems so that they can be fixed before bad actors exploit them. Google calls this the Vulnerability Reward Program, and it was first launched in 2010. According to Google, in 2019, the top prize in this category was around $1 million for hacking a Google Pixel phone. Though this next part is the interesting thing. The Google outage occurred just a mere few hours after it was discovered that the US government had been targeted by a foreign cyber attack. The hack was so serious that it led to an emergency National Security Council meeting at the White House. Experts are calling it one of the most sophisticated hacks ever seen. It was done through something called a supply chain hack. A software tool called SolarWinds that was used by government departments was infected with malware during an update. After this, the hackers were able to monitor internal emails and do some general snooping. The infected software update in question was released all the way back in March of 2020 and lay undetected until last week. Thousands of companies and American government departments use some form of SolarWinds software. Some affected by the hack include the Department of Homeland Security, Department of Justice, Department of Defense, the Treasury Department, NASA, the NSA, and more. All of the top 10 US telecom companies 
and 425 of the US Fortune 500 companies are all said to be at risk. It's estimated that 18,000 clients had installed the infected update. Ironically for the topic of this video, SolarWinds software monitors computer networks of businesses and governments for outages. Government officials admit they were stunned by the sophistication of the hack and that many of America's most deeply held secrets may have been stolen. They were able to access different levels of credentials. In other words, they got in through the back door, then they were able to get into the front door of uh, all of our homes and all of our buildings and all of our government agencies. As I was producing this video, there was some more breaking news. A Microsoft security analyst believes that there was a second group that launched a second attack on the same SolarWinds software. It's an evolving story and we have to wait and see what happens here. So this is speculation on my part. But what if this massive Google outage was a response to the SolarWinds attack? Google staff may have been hurriedly shoring up their security and the scrambling resulted in some downtime across all of their services. For a massive worldwide outage to occur just a few hours after a massive cyber attack on some of America's greatest companies is pretty interesting timing to put it mildly. So linking back to the main topic of this episode, Google's outage can be seen as a stark reminder of our hyperconnectedness. The company has become a bottleneck for so much of the world's processes. It's become part of a massive system, and if it breaks, that also has massive consequences. For just one company to become an unexpected choke point for global productivity is pretty unnerving. This whole conversation isn't even to mention privacy issues, or the shady origins of Google, or having your digital profile sold for ad revenue. So what can be done? Well, the solution is obvious. There's alternatives to Google for every service they provide. It really comes down to the individual person or business. What it all comes down to is trading in some of that convenience that we've all gotten used to. So what do you guys think? Do you think that the world is too dependent on Google? Were you affected by the Google outage? And if so, what were you thinking at the time? I just wanted to say a big thanks to all of you who responded to my post about me going through some health issues. It's really nice to know that you guys cared. So I'm pretty much back at 100% now, so it's all good. That being said, this is going to be the final Cold Fusion episode of the year. So I'm wishing that you enjoy your holidays, and I'll see you next year. If you want to follow me, you can check me out on Twitter and Instagram. And if you want to listen to some newer music that I've made, you can check out my SoundCloud. Links for everything will be below. Anyways, my name is Dagogo, and you've been watching Cold Fusion. Cheers, guys. Have a good one. Cold Fusion. It's new thinking.